We're going to be talking, as we look through John, we've been studying, hey, what does this passage specifically teach us about Jesus? What does this passage show us about who Jesus is? And um, we've been looking at each of these passages and seeing a different attribute or a characteristic of Jesus from each of these sections that we've looked at. And this morning, we're going to discover that Jesus is where we find freedom. Jesus is freedom. That word freedom is a word that's very popular, right? Um, we freedom, but freedom is a costly possession. It's a coveted possession. It's something we all want. Every one of us wants freedom. We want freedom from all kinds of things. Freedom from poverty, freedom from pain, freedom from fear, freedom from confusion, freedom from debt, freedom from addiction, freedom from tyranny, freedom from anything that we can think of. We want to be free, as that profound theologian, um, William Wallace, um, Braveheart, some of the greatest movie, one of the greatest movies ever created, once said, um, it's all for nothing if you don't have freedom. It's all for nothing if you don't have freedom. Now listen, while freedom from these things can be a good desire, it is not the ultimate freedom that you and I need. You see, there's a freedom that supersedes all of these other pursuits of freedom, a freedom that if we possess it, empowers us against all the other pursuits of freedom that we desire. And that freedom is the freedom that we find in Jesus, which is a freedom from the greatest enemies that we will ever face in our lives, a, that will enable us to fight against the tyranny of these lesser enemies, those great enemies of sin, a great enemy of Satan, of hell and death. These, these enemies are greater enemy than being in poverty or any terrorist group or any tyrant or any missile or cancer or disease or struggle that you face in life. Those are the things that we need to be concerned about. In our passage this morning, we're going to find people who, quote unquote, follow Jesus, but they're not really following Jesus at all. We find people who profess to believe in Jesus, but they don't really believe in Jesus at all. They're more concerned about the little enemies of wanting to be recognized in public, public people's opinion of them, their religious achievements, their political freedom, that they're, than they are about the greater enemies of sin and Satan and death and hell. So these guys come to Jesus and they say, hey, we believe you, we're going to follow you. And Jesus says, no, you're not. You're not really following me. And you say, Sam, these guys say they believe in Jesus. If you look at verse 30, they profess, they say that they're going to follow him. And Jesus says, no. And you say, Sam, if these guys say they're going to follow Jesus and Jesus says they don't, how do I know? How do I know if I'm really following Jesus? How do I know if I'm really pursuing Jesus and not religion, how do I know if I'm not just playing church or if I'm not just here this morning simply because I'm doing a religious duty? How do I know if I truly get the gospel? How do I know if I truly get what this is all about? Listen, you have to have your eyes open to the depth of your depravity to the reality of your heart. You have to feel your change. You have to feel the bondage that you're in. Until you come to the end of yourself, until you raise the white flag of surrender, you and I, we cannot be saved. You know the penny has dropped when your heart is laid before an infinite holy God and you approach him in faith, weak, trembling, but with boldness, knowing that he has loved you and forgiven you and accepted you. You know you get it when you realize that the Bible and all of it is not about you and what you've done, but it's about Jesus and what he's done for you. You know the gospel seed has begun to germinate in your soul when you look out into the world and you don't see those people out there and how they can never get it right, but you see that you yourself are the chief of sinners, that you need grace. And because God has given you grace, you can offer grace to other people. As we dive into the passage, let me encourage some of you in this room, you've been coming and you're wrestling with your faith. You're wrestling whether this is true or not. And you are hearing the gospel week in and week out. But can I encourage you that this is exactly where you need to be? It's okay to wrestle with the claims of Christianity, with the person and the work of Jesus. That's okay. I grew up in a church that said you have to believe, and if you don't believe, you're out, right? I mean, but it's okay when you wrestle with it, when you struggle through it, eventually you'll come to a point where the Holy Spirit will open your hearts 
to the truths, and this will be your faith. It'll be something you own, something you possess, and that's totally good. That means you're taking this seriously, and this is serious. And let's not forget the disciples who were with Jesus for three and a half years, and they saw Jesus do miracles. They saw all of Jesus. They heard all of Jesus' teaching. They saw all the ways that Jesus behaved. They really didn't get the gospel until after the resurrection itself. Doesn't make no mistake about it. Justification being saved is a one-time event by faith alone in Jesus. But the gospel, as Jesus, James, and Peter would put it, is like a seed that's planted in our heart, that's watered and watered till it eventually breaks through the soil of your heart and by faith causes it to be born, causes you to be born again. And in that process, there are many dark, cold nights where it seems like nothing is going on. But you're just waiting and waiting and then one day that seed begins to germinate and soon a sprout breaks out and then pretty soon after that that plant begins to produce fruit see this is how the gospel works this is how god transforms lives it's a process it takes time you hear the gospel you question it you doubt it you feel confused you go through dark nights where you wonder if it's true or not and then one day the gospel seed begins to germinate and you awaken by faith and you realize that man jesus is worth pursuing and worth living for so can I encourage you, if you're here and you're struggling, keep listening. Keep putting yourself before the imperishable seed of God's word because sooner or later God will bring fruit in your life. And may the Holy Spirit open your eyes to the reality of your bondage of sin and the freedom that's offered in Jesus. So let's look at this passage. A lot of stuff in here. Let's see what we're in bondage to and let's see what our greatest enemies are. And let's see how freedom is ultimately found in Jesus. First thing I want you to see is that we are in bondage to sin. We're in bondage to sin. Look at verse 31. Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Remember, Jesus is speaking to people who, in verse 30, claimed to profess to believe in him. They made a profession because they didn't want to die in their sin. But the gospel hasn't still gone in yet. The seed was still on the outside trying to get deeper into the ground. They heard Jesus' claims. They seen Jesus' miracles. They seen all that he's done. And they're like, well, I could add a little bit of Jesus into my life. Maybe Jesus can be life insurance for me. But listen, guys, there are people out there that teach that, hey, if you could say a sinner's prayer... And the moment you say that prayer, you're saved forever. That no matter what you do after that, you can live whatever way you want. That because you said this prayer, you almost have like this life insurance card that you keep in your back pocket. The moment you die, you get to heaven, you pull out that card, say, hey, Jesus, on such and such a date, I said this prayer, I've got to go in. Listen, that is a mockery of the gospel. That's a mockery of the work of the cross that isn't in the Bible. That whole sinner's prayer concept, that's not even in Scripture. That's something that we came up with hundreds and thousands of years later. The gospel, the transformation is something that, it's not something you say a prayer, but it's a life that's transformed by the work of the Spirit. You can say prayer after prayer, but if your life isn't transformed, something's wrong. The evidence that you're a follower of Jesus is not that you've said a prayer the evidence of, that you're a follower of Jesus is you're being transformed by the work and the power of Jesus. Look at the text. Jesus says, these guys who believe, and he goes after them in love. He seeks to help them see that they're not really following him, but they're still on the outside looking in. They haven't come to grips with what they're in bondage in. They haven't come to the end of themselves. Jesus says the test of true saving faith is that you abide or you camp or you dwell in his word and thus count what Jesus says as more valuable and more precious than what anything else in this world says. Notice he doesn't say if you abide, if you continue in my word, you will become my disciples. The actual translation says if you continue in my word, you will show that you are my disciples. Becoming a follower of Jesus is not a process it's a one-time event. The result will be that you will experientially know the truth, which is Jesus, and you will be set free from what enslaves us, which is sin. To follow Jesus is to know Jesus. Not just on a 
intellectual level, but on an intimate, emotional level. Do you know him? Or do you know just about him? See, when you truly know Jesus, when you truly encounter Jesus on a deep level, the result, the immediate result is a, a life of humility. A life where you recognize that I'm more sinful than I ever possibly could be and Jesus was more perfect and he took my place and he died for me. That produces a humility in your life. But notice, these guys don't get it. They get defensive. They lean on their heritage. They lean on their upbringing. They lean on their culture instead of leaning on Jesus. Verse 33, they answered him, Jesus, we're the offspring of Abraham and we've never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say that you will become free? So what these guys are doing is basically saying, hey, listen, my family is a Christian. I grew up in a Christian home. I've grown up in church week in and week out. I'm from Texas. Of course I'm a Christian. I'm an American citizen. I'm, by, by, my, by the fact that I'm a citizen, I'm a Christian. This is what these guys are saying. They didn't see their need for freedom because they thought that what they've done or who their daddy was would be enough. They were blinded to their depravity. They were blinded to where they were stuck. They didn't feel like they needed any freedom. And notice how stupid sin makes you. They make this comment, we've never been enslaved. Really? You, the Jewish people, who basically their entire existence have been in slavery, you've never been enslaved? Read Exodus, Read Exodus. right? I mean, you spent years, 400 years in slavery. You come out of that, then all through Judges, you're consistently enslaved by different kings. You're enslaved by Assyria, by Babylon, by the Persians, by the Greeks. And right now, as you're talking to Jesus, you're enslaved by the Romans. You've never been enslaved? They fail to see their own bondage. Listen, if you don't see yourself as broken, if you don't see yourself as sinful and dreadfully cracked like Humpty Dumpty after he fell with no one able to put him back together again, then you'll never get the gospel. If you think that your works or your acts is what's going to, what you're going to present to Jesus on that day when you stand before him, you don't get the gospel. But when you recognize that you are absolutely broken in need of a savior, you get it. At that point, the seed goes from being on the outside to beginning to take root in your life. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits a sin, commits sin is a slave to sin. Jesus doesn't even answer their stupidity about being slaved to the Romans. He says, listen, being slaved to a nation doesn't even hold any weight to the fact that you are enslaved to sin. To be enslaved means that it rules over you. It dominates you. It takes your lunch money and it eats your lunch food in, right in front of you. That's what it does. It, it takes your affections by the throat. As Socrates said, how can you call a man free when his pleasures rule over him? You can tell people that you're happy and you're free, but when you get up in the morning and you look in the mirror, are you really free? When you're all alone and you reflect on your life, are you really free? The entire human race, because we've all sinned, is enslaved to sin, which means you and I, we're not free at all. But there are people out there that will say, no, I'm free because I don't need God. I don't need Jesus. I don't need the church. It's, all of that is just a crutch. It's a straitjacket. We think that freedom is the absence of confinement and constraint, having no God. But everything in life tells us that's not true. Everything in life tells us that's not true. If you play music, you practice piano for years, day in and day out, confining yourself to the real rules of music and discipline so that you can be set free to play beautiful music. A train is free to run when it submits to the track. The freedom of the train is not when it gets off the track and goes over a cliff. It's when it submits to the track that it's on. A fish is not free when it's flopping around on your kitchen floor. It's free when it's constrained to where it belongs, to water. Freedom has to have restrictions or it's no longer freedom, but it's chaos and death. In other words, you all must have a Lord. You all must have a ruler. You all must have a God. Something or someone must be ultimate to you. The question is, which one will set you free to be so that you will be who you're made to be? 
the argument I'm making is that there is a creator who made you to be constrained in him. And you are instead believing that you don't need him at all. Throw off the restraints of your loving creator and you will dash against the rocks of this world because you will live for what you are enslaved to. What you find your identity and security in controls your desires, your affections, your drive, your motives, your actions. It drives you. You see, you're not free as our culture defines it as being free to live for yourself. You're enslaved and you're born that way. You're free to choose your master, but you're not free to choose your freedom. And there's only one master that will set you free. In verse 35. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you're the offspring of Abraham. Yet you seek to kill me because my words find no place in you. I speak of what I've seen with my father. And you do what you have heard from your father. So these Jews thought that they get a free pass because Abraham was their father. And for them, it was those people out there, they need the gospel. Those people out there, those um, Romans and those Samaritans and those people out there, they're the ones that need to hear this. We don't need to hear this. We're good. God's already accepted us. God's already forgiven us. We're right. But they, they need Jesus. Those people out there was their mentality. And if we're not careful, that becomes our mentality as well. We get so used to hearing God's word week in and week out. And then sometimes when we're hearing a sermon, it's almost like, oh, I don't need that. Someone else needs to hear that. They mean like, oh, I wish so-and-so was here today because he really needed to hear that, right? Um, that becomes our mentality. What do you see when you look at people from, that are different from you? People of different creeds or different countries or different political views. Do you look your nose down at them? Do you feel superior to them? Or do you recognize that they are in need of grace just as much as you're in need of grace? And do you respond accordingly? Sin has spread to every man, regardless of their ethnic background, regardless of their social economic background. No man is more or less dead in sin than the other. And why are these guys seeking to kill Jesus? Did he do anything wrong that they wanted to kill him? No. He started, he got to them. And because of their pride, they didn't want to be told that they were enslaved to someone, and now they wanted to kill him. They didn't make room for Jesus. No one ever made room for Jesus. That word um, there is the same that was used for when Jesus birthed, when no one made room for him at the end. Notice Jesus also says that their enslavement is not just through, true theologically, but it's also true pragmatically. He has been in heaven all this time, and he looks down at us, and he sees our enslavement to sin, and all that's all he's ever seen is that we are in bondage to sin. And this is why he comes, so that he can rescue us. The psalmist says it this way in Psalms 14. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there's any who would understand, who seek after God. They've all turned aside together. They have become corrupt. There is no one that does good, not even one. Listen, the first step for you to, and I to find freedom is to see and feel the chains of sin in our lives. Sin has a real strong grasp on our culture. People aren't free in this world, but we're enslaved to whatever idol that we have chosen. And that can be money, and that can be sex, and that can be power, that can be fame, that can be accolades, that can be achievement, that can be approval, that can be family, that can be spouse, or kids, or jobs, or looking good, or being cool, or being moral, or being upstanding, or being liked. It could be any of those things, but these idols have enslaved you because you've made them the ultimate things in your life, and that's what you pursue, and that's what you seek after, and that's what sin is, that we make something else more glorious than Jesus is. And only Jesus can set you free. First of all, we see that we're in bondage to sin. Secondly, we see that we're in bondage to Satan. Now listen, we don't like to, we don't like to admit that we're not in control of our lives. That somehow we are in bondage to something. But Jesus is going to make clear that it's not just something that we're in bondage to. It's someone. Behind our enslaving idols is a grueling taskmaster who is wielding his power like a cruel warden. Verse 39. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to him, if you're Abraham's children, you would be doing what Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. 
That's not what Abraham did. These guys are still thinking, hey, because of our lineage to Abraham, that we're okay. But Jesus is going to tell them, listen, your father is completely different. Your father is not Abraham. If you were Abraham's children, you would believe Jesus just like Abraham did. Abraham didn't try to kill Jesus or God in the Old Testament. When Jesus and his messengers came to Abraham in the Old Testament, Abraham welcomed them. He met them. He bowed to them. He fed them. How different was Abraham, their father's reception of Jesus, than their reception of Jesus? Verse 41. You are doing what your father did. They said to him, We were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. These guys are starting to catch the drift that Jesus is saying that Abraham really isn't your father, according to Jesus. And now they're upset. And they do what every person does when they get attacked. They immediately attack back and they start calling Jesus' names. This turns into a political debate. They don't just go after Jesus now, but they go after Jesus' mom as well. They say, hey, we all know that your mom and your dad slept together before they got married. You know that you were legitimate. And we know you're a legitimate child, that you're not, you're not good enough or worthy enough. And so they begin to attack Jesus, verse 42. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It's, it's, it's not, it is because you cannot bear to hear my word. Jesus says, why don't you listen to what I'm saying? And he answers himself. He says, the reason you don't listen is because you don't have the power to do so. You don't want to hear you never really wanted to hear from God at all. You just wanted to be seen as better than other people. You never really cared about what God said, even though you claimed to care about what God said. You only cared about your own reputation. As long as your adherence to God's word brought you a good reputation, you would do it. Is that you this morning? Is that me this morning? Are we more interested in putting out a good performance out there in front of other people or are we really passionately in love with Jesus? You see, when you get this, when you get this, it all changes. It frees you from the fear of man. It frees you from the need to defend yourself. It frees you from the chains of reputation. You don't have to care about putting up a front, acting like you've got your life all together. Grace frees you to confess your sin openly, to let people into your life, to say, hey, listen, I'm struggling. Help. If you don't know Jesus, if you don't know grace, then your reputation is everything for you and you will play things very close to the vest and you will not let people into your life. You'll, let, you'll do everything possible to hide sin and struggles because you care more about what people think than about what Jesus thinks. And if that's you, listen, the seed hasn't gone in all the way. And so Jesus reveals to these people who their father really is. Verse 44. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Man, talk about telling it as it is. Jesus does not mince words here. Your father is the devil. Done. Right? <laughs> Mic drop. I'm gone. Um... Jesus says you have this literally, they literally lust, they long for, they have this strong craving to do what Satan desires. It's not that they're puppets or pawns or members of some satanic cult, but rather they like to do Satan's work and you don't even realize that you're doing it. Satan, listen, he deceives us. He lifts the chains of our idols a little bit to think that it's okay to relieve the pressure and the weight so you really feel like it's not that bad. He whispers in our ears, you're okay. You're free. You don't need a master. You don't need rescuing. You're fine just the way you are. You don't need to confess sin. You can live the way you live. It's okay. You have a good reputation. You're fine. Don't let people into your life. And then when you are down, he will kick you and he will let the chain drop so that the guilt is so overwhelming that it kills you. That's how Satan works. Look at verse 45. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. 
The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. So here Jesus contrasts himself with the devil. Jesus says, you're like the devil because he doesn't want the truth and he doesn't want to do the truth. And that's exactly what you want. You don't want to know the truth. You want to be oblivious to your chains and your bondage. But Jesus says, I've come to offer you freedom. You can hear almost a compassion in Jesus' voice in this verse. He says, why don't you believe me? Why do you want to be in bondage? Why do you want to be stuck? Do you not see that that freedom is standing right in front of you? And he says, the reason you are is because you're literally dead in your sins. Verse Ephesians, we read this passage. It says, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. My friends, apart from Jesus, we are in bondage to sin, and we are in bondage to Satan. That doesn't mean that you're as evil as you possibly could be. It doesn't mean you walk around with horns on your head. But it does mean that you're deceived. And that's exactly where sin and Satan do their greatest work. To make you think you're okay. And the result of that is that we face our third enemy. And that is that we are in bondage to death. The chains of sin, the chains of sin will enslave you. Satan as an evil taskmaster will drag you by those chains and keep you down. And death becomes the inevitable result. Death becomes your destiny. Verse 48. Jesus answered him, are we not right in saying, the Jews answered him, are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and you have a demon? Jesus answered, I don't have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. The Jews again, they're like out of things to say so they just call him names again because they know they're guilty they have nothing else to say you can hear them reaching back into their memory and they're like man what's the biggest cut down that we could do what's the biggest attack we can do oh yeah we don't like the Samaritans the Samaritans are wimps they're half breeds let's call Jesus a Samaritan and so they do that but Jesus says he honors God continuously and they dishonor Jesus continuously and thus dishonoring Jesus is to dishonor God 51 verse 51 Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, you'll never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died and the prophets who died? How do you, who do you make yourself out to be? Now these guys are angry. They have had enough of Jesus. You could probably hear them almost cynically laughing at Jesus right now. They believe that Jesus has lost his mind. Abraham clearly is dead. So are these prophets that they loved. How can Jesus say that people will not die if they believe in him when Abraham, their father, died and prophets have died? And in a sense, these guys have a point, right? Death has, gra- has, grasped, has grabbed the greatest of men and it's going to grab you and I as well. All of us will be captured by death one day. How can Jesus say that death will not grab those who follow him? On top of that, how can Jesus escape or cheat death himself? Verse 56. Jesus words, Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. Jesus says, Abraham didn't die. You see, the Bible talks about two kinds of death. There's a separation of the soul from the body. Abraham actually literally died. But there's a separation of the soul from God in eternity, which Abraham never experienced. He was with God the moment he died. This is why Abraham rejoiced about the day of Jesus coming. This is why Jesus would say in Matthew 8 that many will come from the east and the west and recline with Abraham in the kingdom of God. Abraham was never separated from God, even though his body went to the ground. Abraham still lives, and he will continue to live on. He believed that Jesus was a coming Savior, a substitute for our sins. Genesis 22, Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide. And it is said to this day, on that mount, the Lord, it, it shall be provided. Abraham also believed in the resurrection. In Hebrews 11, it talks that 
And after trying to sacrifice Isaac and God stops him, he says he considered that God was able to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Abraham, unlike these guys, made room for Jesus. Abraham knew that he needed a savior, and he believed that Jesus was coming, and he rejoiced that Jesus was here. As a matter of fact, Jesus spoke with Abraham about 30 years before he left heaven to earth. Abraham was with Jesus. Go back to verse 57. So the Jews said to him, Listen, you're not even 50 years old, and you've seen Abraham? The Jews are trying to catch on here, and they're trying to process this. And like, Abraham's like 2,000 years old, dude. You're like barely 30. How have you seen Abraham? Verse 58. Jesus said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up the stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. The Jews had no doubt what Jesus was saying. He says, before Abraham was born, listen, I was there. Before Abraham and Sarah got married, I was there. Before Abraham ever received the promise that he would be a great nation, I was there. Before Abraham and Lot split ways, I was was there before Sarah ever had Isaac I was there on that mountain when Isaac was about to be sacrificed I was there when Abraham worried his wife Sarah I was there not I what but Jesus I before Abraham was I am he says not I was or I will be but I am That's a very powerful word. That's the word that's used in the Old Testament when God identifies with the people of Israel as they're leaving Egypt I am The result of Jesus' statement is that these people begin to pick up stones to murder Jesus. They couldn't handle the truth. I want you to notice the first section that we did in John 8 and the last section that we're doing in John 8 both have to do with the stoning. They wanted to kill the adulterous woman and they wanted to kill Jesus both by stoning. These guys had a affinity towards stoning um, for some reason. Where did these leaders get these stones from? These guys were standing in the middle of the temple. Stones were just lying around on the temple floor. And they didn't have a license to carry stones around, right? Um, where did they get these stones in the temple area? More than likely that these stones that the, these stones that these people are picking up are probably the very same stones that were originally intended to kill the women in the beginning of John 8. The stones that were meant for you and I would be hurled at Jesus instead. He would come to set us free, but in order to let you walk away, he would have to lock himself in and take yours and I, your, mine and your death sentence for us. If you've read Charles Dickens' book, A Tale of Two Cities, there are two men in that story who both look alike, and they love the same women. Charles Darney, Sidney Carton. Lucy, the woman the men love, makes her choice that she wants to be with Charles. She marries him, has a baby. Sidney, the other man, is brokenhearted. He's crushed. The story develops at the time of the French Revolution. Charles... The husband is arrested, he's imprisoned, and he awaits the guillotine. And as the novel concludes, Sidney, who has been an enemy of Charles all this time, visits him in prison the night before his execution. And he offers to Charles, he says, listen, I will take your place. You've got a wife, you've got a baby. But Charles absolutely refuses. So Sidney drugs him, smuggles him away in a carriage, and Charles escapes with his family alive. But Sidney knew that they would forever chase Charles. And the only way to rescue Charles and Lucy and the baby's freedom was to take Charles's place. So he sneaks back into the prison and he dies in the place of Charles. That night in prison, a young seamstress who was about to die the next day was speaking with who she thought was Charles. Suddenly she realized that it really wasn't Charles, but it was someone else. And she goes, so you're willing to die for him? And he answers, and for his wife and the child. 
And the seamstress at that moment confesses that she's terrified of tomorrow's death and not sure if she's able to face it head on. And she asks Sidney if he would hold her hand to the end. And as they went to the guillotine the next day, they faced death hand in hand. She was comforted and helped to the end as she kept her eyes on Sidney. It was his substitutionary sacrifice. It was his love that gave her hope and comfort in the moment of her death. My friends, listen, we are Charles Darney. We are the seamstress. Jesus takes our place so that we can go free. Jesus holds our hands in death and welcomes us into his presence. This is the essence of freedom. You see, while ancient deities would ask for blood and sacrifice and time and treasure to give you freedom, which is exactly what all of our idols require of us, Jesus gives his own blood and sacrifices his own life so that you and I can have freedom. In the book of Acts, pastors, in a sense, are encouraged to, by these words. They say, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his blood. You are purchased by the blood of Jesus. But listen, you've got to ask the question, if God wants to forgive, why not just forgive? Why blood? Why die for us? Why go into the prison? Why go to the cross? Why go through all of this for our freedom? You could say almost in a sense that one of the main reasons is to show us just how serious God is about sin. That he's not content to just sweep it under the rug of the universe. That God is too holy just to wink at sin. That payment has to be made either by us in hell or by Jesus on the cross. But I think there's another answer for why the blood, the substitution, why the cross was necessary. Dietrich Bonhoeffer would say that all forgiveness is suffering. You know, when someone sins against us, when someone hurts us, there are three things that we could do, three options. You can either make the person pay through vengeance. You can either withdraw into isolation and try to do nothing and forget about it. Or you can pay for it yourself by forgiving them and thus taking the suffering on yourself. The first option is that you pay through vengeance. But if you choose to have them pay for it, it passes on to you and you become evil yourself. In other words, you eventually become jaded. That option really doesn't work. The second option is you choose to withdraw into isolation and you try not to do anything about it and you forget it. You can try to just lick the wounds and not put yourself out there anymore. But the problem is you'll grow callous and you'll grow cold and you'll grow and you'll never forget. So that option doesn't work either. But if you choose that third option, which is to forgive the other person, then you suffer. There's no other way around it. That's what Bonhoeffer's saying, that if you've really been wronged, then you know this because to forgive is to not bring it on yourself, not to bring it on them, not to bring it on other people. You take the payment for their wrong. Think about God for a moment. We ruined his creation. We destroyed the human race. We kill each other. We attack each other. We steal from each other. We destroy families. We kill babies. We pillage our planet. We basically told God to go away, that we've got this, that we don't need his help, that we don't need freedom. And meanwhile, we're enslaved to all these idols that we hold dear to. And so God has three options with us. He can make us pay because he is righteous. He can do that with no ill effect to himself. He can enact justice without becoming corrupt in the process. He can leave us to ourselves, and that is hell, separation from God himself. The sec second option is not possible for God because God's too holy. Do you think that God is just going to sit back and do nothing when wrong is happening? He's too holy. He's too righteous to just sit back and watch us destroy creation. And so that leaves the third option. He can forgive. But in order to forgive, he must suffer so that he takes it upon himself. In order to forgive us, he has to absorb our sin into himself, to kill sin without killing us in the process. And that, my friends, is the meaning of the cross. That, my friends, is where freedom is found. This is why the writer of Hebrews would say that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Jesus had to become our Sidney Carton. Our freedom is not free. It costs Jesus his life. 
When Jesus died, he conquered sin, Satan, death, and hell. In his death and resurrection, he loosened the bonds of sin. He crushed the head of Satan. He removed the teeth of death, and he absorbed the separation of hell. Sin, Satan, death, and hell are all poured, all poured their greatest fury on Jesus on the cross. And when he was on that grave, that cold, dark grave, and when they all stood they all stood on the tomb, sin and death and Satan and hell. They were pushing the rock to make sure Jesus never gets out. But Jesus burst out for you, for me. He rose again. He busted a hole through the back of death. And because of that, you and I now have freedom. If you will but turn to Jesus and repent of your sin and repent of your idols, you can be free and you can be free indeed. Brothers, sisters, I call on you by the power of the Holy Spirit to turn to Jesus, to pursue Jesus, to love Jesus, to make him your treasure, to make him your joy, to make him your delight more than anything else. Pursue Jesus. Lay your deadly going down, down at Jesus' feet and stand in him alone, wonderfully complete. Are you free in Jesus? Playing church is not going to win you freedom, just more bondage. Just doing religious duty is not going to win you freedom. It's just more bondage, more guilt. Are you free in Jesus? Do you enjoy the embrace of his love? Do you recognize that he has loved you and redeemed you and called you his own? Is your identity found in him? Or is your identity found in the things that you do for him? Are you free this morning? Some of you in this room, you've been going to church all your life and you're not free. You're stuck. You're doing stuff. You're doing it for the sake of doing it. You go to church because that's what you're supposed to do. You want to earn brownie points with God, but you're not free. And Jesus calls you to freedom this morning. He invites you to say, listen, I have loved you. I've died for you. Knowing the absolute worst about you, I died for you. I have accepted you. Listen, I've got you in the palm of my hand, and not a devil in the world can take you out. You're mine. Do you find freedom in that? Do you find joy in that? Or are you in bondage this morning? As we go to communion this morning, listen, if you're a follower of Jesus, remember your chains Remember what it was like for Jesus to take your death sentence and to set you free so that you can live in freedom. Maybe you found yourself running back to these things that have enslaved you in the past. Maybe Satan this morning is having a field day with you by sending wave after wave of guilt over your soul. Can I encourage you, remember your freedom in Jesus. Remember your freedom in Jesus. As William Wallace said, they can take your life, but they can't take your freedom. Listen, let that freedom in Jesus move you to become vulnerable. Let that freedom in Jesus move you to become honest. Let that freedom in Jesus move you to build greater connection to the church community. Let that freedom in Jesus move you to a greater passion for obeying and following Jesus. Let that freedom in Jesus move you to a greater passion for you to pour out in service especially to our community to people that need Jesus let that freedom in Jesus move you to a greater passion for the mission of the gospel let that freedom move us this morning may the freedom that we find in Jesus empower us enable us to live the life that he calls us to live may it not be about all that we do so that God has to accept us. May it be that, God, you've accepted me. Now I get to live for you, for your glory. I am free and free in you alone. Some of you this morning, you're in bondage. And Jesus is calling you to freedom. Some of you are stuck. You're in chains. And the devil is telling you that you're not good enough. And Jesus is saying, I have set you free. You're free indeed. You need to listen to the voice of Jesus this morning. You need to hear him. And you need to let that soak in and you need to live in light of that.